um, as at, at least in real life as I perceive it, uh, which may be different than your real life. So all acknowledgements there. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm Judith Soldias, and I've been managing projects. I stopped counting at 20 years because it was getting a little embarrassing, but I've been um, doing both um, internal um, work with, um, I worked 15 years with a nonprofit um, in Chicago, and more recently I've spent about 10 years working with consultancies uh, in custom software development, specifically using agile methodologies. So I do have a bias towards that, but today I'm gonna try to be as unbiased as I possibly can. So um, what we're gonna talk about today, by the way, is all gonna be full of roller coaster cats. I warn you now, this is not the theme for you, then drop, drop out now. But um, so what we're gonna talk about today is projects but specifically phases and rituals we're going to talk just a tiny bit about methodologies um but i really want to spend more time into each of the phases of a project and then we'll go into the activities related to the rituals or ceremonies or meetings depending on what terminology you want to use that are common in agile work a lot of what i'm talking about today uh, all the academic stuff will come from chat GPT. Uh, it's all correct and there's nothing wrong with it, but I do like to supplement that um, and give you some of uh, my real world examples so that you have a sense of um, things that I have encountered through uh, my experience. Uh, in terms of uh, norms, uh, you do you, just be respectful to others. Uh, put the camera on if you want, if not, that's fine. Uh, but I am not actively monitoring the chat because there's only so many things I can do at once. So if you do raise your hand, um, then I will try to stop to address your questions. I've got a couple of pauses in the presentation to address those as well, but it's uh, a very small group right now. So please feel free. We can um, certainly, you know, uh, interrupt me and, uh, and address your questions. All right. Uh, any actual questions before we get started? Excellent. All right, um, let's talk about what a project actually is a little bit, just to do some context setting. Um, a project is technically defined as something that has a beginning, an end, and a deliverable. This is always true. Um, this is how PMI defines it, uh, the Project Management Institute, uh, but it is true if you do not have a beginning or an end or a specific endeavor that you are accomplishing, then you're probably doing something that's operational. Not a bad thing, but also not a project. And if you're working on a project, you generally will have uh, what's known as the triple constraint, time, scope, and money. Um, as they say, pick two. Um, so time obviously refers to how long the project is gonna take to deliver. Uh, scope is about how much functionality can be delivered within that amount of time and money or budget um, because it matters, right? Uh, nobody's gonna write us a blank check to run their project. I mean, I hope so, but that hasn't happened to me yet. So if it happens to you, that's great. But the reason they say pick two is because you can have two of these be um, uh, hard-coded, if you will, like they can be fixed, but you cannot have three things be fixed. So something has to give, something's gonna have to be negotiated. And it cannot, and you, so it cannot be that the three things are rigid. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, but this is an important part of managing projects that you need to be aware of. Um, also, every project literally is different. Um, you'll hear people, talk, hear people talk about how, you know, this project is the snowflake. They're all snowflakes, they're all different. Uh, and that's the beauty of projects, right? Um, there are a lot of, commonalities and, um, and characteristics between them that are very similar, but ultimately every project is different, just like every team and every company culture is different, every project is as well. And that's a good thing. Um, you, will, you will eventually figure out the best way to work within a project over time. If, um, if it's anything like me, then by the time you figure out, sometimes it's too late, right? But uh, I'm gonna give you some tips and some tools uh, to um, hopefully get you closer to that today. I only want to spend a little bit on methodologies, um, mostly because, oh, Lennon, um, go ahead. You have a question? Did 
it was a raised hand. Okay. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask it. Um, in terms of methodologies, you've probably heard a lot of this out there. Um, I'm going to cover just a couple of them. So you're probably familiar with what's called traditional or waterfall. Essentially, it's a more linear and sequential process. You do one phase, you stop. You do another phase, you complete that. You do the next phase, you complete that. This has uh, been, you know, done for decades, and it's ideal for projects that you know you know pretty well um, and are fairly well defined, and they don't they have pretty stable sort of requirements. I agree with Chad GPT on this. On the other side of the spectrum, there's Agile, and Agile is really an umbrella for many methodologies, but it really has to do with being iterative and delivering value incrementally. If you need to stop, uh, test reassess, get feedback, and figure out if you're going in the right, if your project is going in the right direction, then you're probably working in Agile methodology. A lot of software development uh, is done in Agile, and so it wouldn't surprise me if most of you who are here um, ended up working in this kind of methodology. There are certainly hybrids in between, um, like, no one is, uh, to my knowledge, just like pure traditional or pure agile. It's, uh, it's a mixed bag, right? And again, it depends on your project, your team, and your company culture. So if I were to illustrate this, um, I would say that traditional looks kind of this way. So, you know, we talked about sequential, right? Like you do this phase, you close it, you do the next phase, you close it, and you move on. If you're working in Agile, then uh, the textbook would suggest that you are iterating through the same rituals and the same practices every cycle. Um, usually that's, you know, I'll refer to it as a sprint or an iteration. Um, usually it's a couple of weeks, but this is what the model for that method looks like. Um, I would argue that in real life, this is what a project is really like. Um, it's messy, right? Um, as, as some of you probably already know, you're trying to figure a lot of things out at the same time. You have people coming and going. You're trying to get used to working with each other. You're trying to understand what the requirements are, how they're going to get delivered, the technology, all of those things. And so towards the end, you're ideally a lot more stable than at the beginning. Uh, but it is perfectly normal for you to feel like you're in a project that's a bit of a roller coaster. At least I certainly feel that way in projects, and I've been doing that for a while. So um, let's see. Let's talk about project phases. So when we think about phases, um, I'm referring specifically to the big chunks of work that happen if you're doing a project sequentially, um, and even otherwise, right? So I'm talking about these specific segments. And I refer to them as like planning analysis, design, development, deployment, and maintenance. You can find other sources that use different terminology for this, but it's essentially very similar um, in concept, right? It's like, you figure out what you're going to do, you plan for it, you figure out how you might deliver that, you design it, you code it if you're doing software, you deploy it, and then hopefully somebody's maintaining it. Um, if you're doing it in Agile, the theory is that you're doing that every iteration, uh, every sprint, you're doing all of these things uh, sequentially every two weeks. I would argue that in real life, uh, what happens in projects is the sales process, right? Like in the sales process, there's some sort of discovery of like basic information. Again, the triple constraints, you know, time, scope, and money. What is it that we're building? Uh, how much money do we have to build it, et cetera. You then have the project, uh, which is sold, um, or if it's an internal company, it's, you know, has a start date, et cetera. And then there's a big chunk of planning analysis, analysis that you're doing up front. And to be clear, like, or to be fair, sometimes that is the project. Sometimes your project is to figure out the next project. But um, oftentimes, what you're going to do is then you're going to kick off the project with a larger team. So, for example, you're going to add more developers, um, or you're going to add the QA resources, or you're going to add maybe another designer, whatever it is that, um, that the project itself might require. And then you begin your ritual. So that's when you really do end up doing like planning and analysis and design and development together in a cyclical sort of form. 
in my experience, um, you're not deploying and doing maintenance every single two weeks. Um, I think it's great if you can, um, but again, like in real life, this doesn't always happen. Uh, and that's also okay. There's reasons why that may not be the case. And I'll talk about some of them in a minute. All right, let's talk a little bit about planning. Um, so this is what you're doing, right? Like you're trying to figure out what you're going to deliver. What are the goals of the project? Um, the scopes, like the features that you're gonna be delivering. And you do some work to figure out how much it's gonna cost based on the kind of team that you're gonna have or the kind of resources that you're gonna have or the purchases that you need to make. This is all true. Um, I think in real life, we need to remember that like no planet survives contact with the enemy, right? Um, not that anyone is our enemy, but like things change. Like all the things that you had thought that you were planning, some of them might change. Uh, that's okay. The scope of what you're going to tackle might change. It changes almost in every project I've been on. Um, and that is okay. That's just a reality of projects. The budget you're going to be working with um, ideally is a range, not a fixed dollar amount. That allows you a little bit more flexibility. And so if you're running a project and you're doing planning around uh, budget, I would try to understand what the realistic range of the budget is for your client or for your company. Because again, triple constraints, right? It can't, you can't have everything be fixed. Uh, like timeline. Um, you may not know, especially early on the project, uh, exactly when you're going to deliver something. Um, you have to have a lot of certainty to be able to do that, which is why the triple constraint, like something has to give. Um, can we negotiate on time, on budget, or on scope? This is part of what you're trying to figure out during the planning phase in real life. Because um, like, you're just not going to know. Um, if anyone has absolute certainty about these things when the project begins, great. They should be making a lot of money and good for them. Um, also, the planning depends on the methodology. So if you're working on like a more traditional model or specific industries, et cetera, you might be leaving the planning session with like a thousand lines of, you know, Microsoft project plans um, or Excel spreadsheets. You may have a ton of Gantt charts. You may have project charters, et cetera. That's fine. If that's how, you know, your company works or your client works, that's one way of doing it. Um, if you're working in other methodologies, you might leave with different sort of assets. So the planning phase looks different depending, or the outputs of the planning phase look different depending on how you're approaching that particular project. But I do have a pet peeve about planning. And that is a great excuse to use this picture, number one. Uh, but number two, is a concept of estimates. Uh, estimates are, by definition, not accurate. And you get yourself in trouble whenever your stakeholders believe that an estimate is realistic. Uh, like, they may be realistic, but they're not a promise or an agreement. And this is a very important conversation to make sure that you have. Not just to say you have it, but to make sure that there is shared understanding with the people that you're working with. Again, pet peeve, great picture. All right, um, in the analysis phase, you're doing exactly what you see here. You're trying to figure out how to address the problem or the opportunity that the project is trying to deliver. So you're going more in depth to figure out things like requirements and constraints, risks, et cetera. Um, this is all true. I think in real life, what that looks like for me is that um, you're probably going into this phase with a lot of assumptions. Because by this time, you've probably been talking about this for days, if not weeks, and you've heard a lot of things from sales folks, from internal folks, maybe from product people. Um, and so you're going into analysis with a lot of different assumptions. I just want you to be open to, open to being wrong about them. It's fine. It's fine to be wrong about assumptions. That's why we want to validate the assumptions. And if that happens, then I want you to be open to changing your priorities or your requirements. This is the stage of the project where it pays to do that. And literally, it is cheaper to make adjustments now rather than later. It is so much cheaper and easier to change priorities or requirements now 
than once a team of engineers has started developing a solution. Um, so that is one of the important parts, I think, like in real life, that analysis brings to the table. Um, and again, it's all a negotiation, right? Um, so I'm, I'm someone who hates the, the term sort of scope creep because I do believe that everything is uh, something that should at least be discussed, um, certainly negotiated. And so a lot, of the, um, a lot of the work you're doing in the analysis phase will lead to negotiation. Again, that's perfectly okay. Whatever you decide to change, if anything, uh, my advice is to make sure that it is explicitly agreed on. Because three months from now, you're not going to remember the one meeting you were in where someone said something for five minutes and we've all forgotten it since. Yes, there's a lot of tools that you have nowadays to do transcripts and take notes and recaps and all those things. But if in three months you have to refer back to the conversation we had today, you're probably already in trouble. So just make sure that the agreements are explicit and people are not continuing to make assumptions about how the project is going to go. All right. In terms of design, um, I always think about this as the interface, but it also is the architecture, other components of the solution, um, as well as things that are more visual or UX related. Uh, oftentimes, the design phase ends with a prototype or a mock-up of the solution. Uh, that's if you believe chat GPT, which is true. But I think in real life, um, it is again another opportunity to validate assumptions. There's, there's, not, you know how like they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a prototype is worth a million, right? Because that's when you really get to visualize what you think you're going to be building and what other stakeholders think they're going, uh, think that you are going to be building for them, depending on who you are in this role playing game that's happening in my head right now. So again, validate assumptions by actually looking at visuals and asking questions and just being like, oh, I thought this was going to work this way. Uh, and then someone's going to be like, well, actually, I thought it was going to be doing it the other way. Great conversations to have at this stage of the game before any development happens. Also, when you talk about prototype or a mock-up, uh, they are completely different things. Uh, so I give you a resource here uh, when you get a copy of the, of the deck. Make sure that you know what the client or your internal um, stakeholders are expecting as part of the deliverables if you do have this this design phase because a fully clickable prototype is not a low fidelity wireframe and i've made that mistake right like not making sure that i understood what the client wanted um, so in the design phase it's important to understand what the outputs of it are going to be Another thing that I think is really important in real life is like, what tech stack are you using? Like, um, how is that going to influence the visual designs? Are the visual designs going to use the patterns and the components that your technology uses because that's what you have to use? Or the other way around, um, are you going to customize the design or um, are you going to pick a different tech stack based on the design? There's no right or wrong. But that is a conversation that needs to happen uh, sooner rather than later on a project because it has uh, considerable financial impact or it has the potential of you know, financial impact. So make sure that you understand that coming out of the design phase. Um, and again, if things need to change, that's OK. This is another good time to change it, to update prototypes or designs, whatever it is that you're working on. Um, and I definitely encourage you to make sure that they are updated because that is the explicit part of uh, agreeing on what you're going to be building. Um, just assume that every slide from now on has like explicitly agree on this thing um, because it's really important. Trust if there's nothing else, like trust me on this one. You do not want to regret this three months down the line when someone's like, but I thought we were doing this. All right. So that's design. Uh, I got a couple more and I'm going to take a break for questions. Then we get into development, which is probably no surprise to anyone on the call. Uh, we're building things, right? It's probably software. Sometimes it's hardware. Sometimes it's communication bridges in between or firmware or whatever um, that, that integrate into the system that you're building. Uh, and it's also the testing phase. It's making sure what you're delivering meets the requirements that you're supposed to meet. So that's what um, that's what the textbook says. It is true. Uh, I think in real life, 
how you code, like how you develop features changes according to each team. Like the practices you'll have change. I'm going to give you a resource right after this um, to kickstart you off, I think, better. Um, well, I don't know about better, but to start, to start you off on the, on the same page, because it's really important that you have some agreements before you start coding. Um, for example, like one of the things you need to do, I would assume, is agree on how you're going to do estimation of the work. Not because I care how you estimate, but the, your takeaway here is that it should be consistent. So everyone on your team should consistently agree to how you're going to do estimation. Also testing. Uh, I've worked with teams that don't always test their own code. Developers don't always test their own code. Uh, please do that. It's really nice when you have code that's tested. And then in terms of like unit testing um, or documentation and refactoring, uh, talk about that as a team, but I definitely encourage you to make that part of your estimates. I've worked with some legacy systems where like your work might take a day, but just refactoring that or updating the documentation takes you an extra day or an extra half a day. And that starts to impact your deliverables and the time that it takes you to get a story out to QA. So definitely think about including those in, in the development uh, of your project. And lastly, just be aware of version dependencies. Um, I think I have this here because it's just like been such a pain for me sometimes. Like when you get this wrong, it really hurts, right? Like make sure that if you're um, building hardware, firmware, and software that's supposed to work together, that it actually does. It sounds very simple, but just don't forget to check on dependencies and versions and all those lovely things. All right. Um, so here I'm going to give you the link to a team agreement. Um, I do a team agreement whenever anybody on the team joins. Uh, no one's, there's no role more important than another. You get a new team member, you do a new team agreement. It may be shorter, but I uh, give you a resource from my very good friend, Gail Silverman, who you should totally follow on, on um, LinkedIn, and then the template as well so that you can have it and adjust it for your own teams. All right, uh, two more phases. So we've got deployment, just exactly what you probably think it is. Uh, you go live with the thing that you have built, right? Um, so I think in real life, deployments should be really boring. Like they should happen and no one should know except the person that pushed out the code. Those are great, they're my favorite. Um, sometimes though, they do require downtime and so you need to communicate this. Um, and I don't mean like if you're the project manager, you need to communicate this to the client. You do. But also if you're the engineer and you know there's going to be downtime, please make sure that you communicate this to other people on the team. It kind of matters. Uh, also, never, ever, ever surprise your DevOps people, uh, your infrastructure team. I've worked on teams that like don't have dedicated infrastructure departments. Um, and so Early in my career, I certainly was going to DevOps and be like, yeah, so, you know, like Tuesday, we're going to go live. Um, and, you know, they didn't like me for a while. So I have learned my lesson. Um, be really kind to your DevOps partners, because this is not a thing you should ever surprise someone. Um, also, like, don't assume that a release is going to go well. You know, like, be happy when it does. But, you know, they don't always go well. So if that's the case, make sure you have a rollback strategy in place. You certainly have a lot of tools these days that let you um, roll code back pretty quickly and seamlessly. Um, whatever your team uses, like, you know, use that, uh, but make sure that you're at least uh, ready to roll something back if, if needed. I hope it's never needed, but all right. And then after you deploy software, like someone's got to maintain it, right? Uh, and so that means regular bug fixes or updates, uh, certainly security patches, et cetera. And sometimes that means um, adding like smaller new features to a solution. Um, I think in real life, what you need to really know is like who's going to be responsible for doing that maintenance? Because that might be different depending on your company or your client or contracts that you have in place. Um, you need to know this in, a, in advance, essentially, because when you don't ask that, that's when you get surprised. And I've certainly seen engineers that 
and me, right, that like got stuck maintaining uh, a project that we thought we were done with, um, but nobody really planned maintenance well enough. And so there's always that one engineer who was on that project and they're supposed to be doing some cool new thing elsewhere and they keep getting interrupted because there's tickets from, you know, the system that they rolled out two months ago. So doing some planning around maintenance here, I think it's just good hygiene um, and certainly good for, for team morale, if you will. Um, and also like, if you talk to people about small features, that's very vague. Uh, make sure that you talk about those pretty explicitly because you never really know what people have in mind when they say, oh, I just want this one simple thing. Uh, or I just, just make this small change, right? Like, I've certainly asked for many small changes in my life and then a developer gets in there and they're like, yeah, that's a database schema change and it needs a migration and that's not, I'm like, okay. So uh, making sure that you understand uh, what those features are when you move into maintenance is pretty important. And those are the phases themselves. So I wanna pause here and go through any questions that you might have about the phases we've covered. Also more cats, you're welcome. All right, no questions. So let's talk about, um, oh, Adrian, go for it, or Adrian. Oh, sorry, uh, it's more of a question for the end then. Sorry, I'll go into agit now if you want. Sorry about that. Oh my God, you're gonna keep me like in suspense for like another 20 minutes, really? You're gonna do that to me, man? Okay, you're welcome to ask it now, otherwise I will move on, it's up to you. All right, um, so more cats. They're playing poker, which I thought was particularly brilliant of me in an Agile uh, presentation, but also a good transition slide to move into. Now we're gonna go into like the activities that happen within each of the um, um, iterations or sprints, whatever you wanna call them. Um, they're technically different things, but I'm not a stickler about any of it. It is a cycle um, and it's usually every two weeks in uh, about 90% of my projects. So every two weeks we do these things. Some are rituals and some are just things that need to be done basically. So what I'm gonna go uh, through next is what we do in each of these rituals uh, and some tips, um, some you know things you should do and things you definitely should stay away from. So um, the project technically or like the iteration really starts with a bunch of planning activities. We're gonna talk about those in, a, in the next slide, but there's a bunch of things that you need to coordinate before you can have your iteration of planning, meaning your IPM. It sounds like the IPM should be where you start, um, but obviously, like, well, I don't, I don't know about obviously. It is not where you start, um, but it is pretty darn close to it. So there's work that you need to do to make sure that your IPM is um, smooth. After IPM, um, you know, you've got the best part of a couple of weeks to do design, development, to test, and um, hopefully every day you're having the daily huddles. I call them huddles, again, because Gail Silverman influenced me. Uh, they're also known as like the daily scrum or the daily stand up, but stand up is a little bit of um, ableist language, so I try to stay away from that. So when I say daily huddles, that's what I mean. And then you're showcasing, you're demoing the work that you've delivered. And hopefully you're getting user feedback because uh, you're doing some testing. This doesn't always happen every sprint, I will tell you in real life. Uh, but ideally that is what you're, uh, what you're doing at the end of your iteration. Um, and then you're going to think about how that went, right? You're gonna have your retrospective. Absolutely do not skip these. Uh, you may skip one, that's it. You get a, you get one pass, um, but a lot of teams skip retros um, and that is a, that's a red flag. That is a bad practice to get into and I am a stickler about that. So, and then you circle all the way around and you keep doing it until your project is essentially done. Sounds easy, right? All right, let's talk about some of the stuff that needs to go into planning and iteration. Um, so designs need to happen, uh, either the initial designs or the updates to the designs, because those are gonna influence the user stories um, or requirements. I'm gonna keep calling them user stories, but it's the work that needs to be delivered. The product owner needs to prioritize the next set of work you're gonna be tackling for those two weeks or however long, um, because you can get to the point where you have 200 stories in your backlog 
and you're not necessarily the person to manage priority. So someone needs to do that and make sure the team is focused on the next set of things to be done. Um, and then you're going to prepare those. You're going to make those stories actionable uh, so they can be estimated. And I'm going to give you some tips about that as well. Uh, in terms of design reviews, um, it's what you think, right? It's like it's going through new designs or through changes. Ideally, this is where engineers can ask questions and provide technical feedback to designers. Um, things like, hey, are we using existing components or is this a new component? I've never cared less in my life about components, but it is a very serious topic of discussion and it matters to both engineers and designers. So like those kinds of things are great topics for a design review. Also things like the kind of interaction that we're supposed to deliver. And if there's a simpler way of delivering that, engineers are awesome at knowing what is more difficult to do. Um, and designers are great at you know, um, providing a great user experience. So when y'all get together, uh, it's lovely to figure out the simplest way to deliver the interaction that people are, is ex are expecting. And also things like, oh, uh, are we auto-saving this page? Again, things that really matter down the line. And a bunch of other stuff, right? Like those tend to happen during design reviews. And then ideally those designs are updated, they're discussed uh, and they're approved uh, by the product owner or product manager, whoever you're working with. And that is how you inform the next set of user stories that you're gonna be working on. Um, I have another cat for you and he's got a tip. And so I like to have the design reviews be separate. So like I, I like the designers and the engineers talking about these like nitty gritty little things together. It's really hard to pronounce. Uh, these very granular things to um, together before we meet with the product owner. Uh, part of it is because sometimes like the politics in the room or like the power dynamics might be different. Sometimes the product owners just, like, just do not care about that level of detail, right? Like you figure out what works for your team, but this is um, what I think works fairly well. Then you get into writing stories, refining them. Uh, in the past, it was also called grooming, like whatever. I have a client who calls it landscaping. So like whatever it is, this, the end goal of this is to have actionable stories that developers can pick up and, uh, and deliver. So generally, again, your product owners decided on priority, but as engineers, you might have opinions on whether there's any technical dependencies and that's okay, right? Like if you speak up and you're like, hey, uh, we need to do this thing before we, need, we do the next thing because otherwise it's not gonna work. Great, that is part of how you figure out uh, the stories that come next. Uh, someone's gotta draft those. Uh, and I say someone in italics because it really depends. Uh, I write a lot of them, um, but I also work with product owners that write them, which is great because I'm not a fan of doing this, right? Uh, I've also had technical leads write them. Um, it's it's really a mixed bag depending on who is in your team and what your company uh, sort of culture and processes are. But someone's drafting this. And ideally, um, if I have my brothers, um, I've got my product owner in there, a couple of engineers, not seven, a couple of engineers and the designer. Um, and we get them ready for estimation. So we talk about what has to be delivered and how it's going to be delivered. And you can do that in the same meeting, you can estimate in the same meeting while it's fresh on your mind or you can do it separately. Um, I don't have a preference on this. Again, it's up to your team and how this works better. You can also change it up during the project and do it one way initially and then change it up, experiment, etc. cetera. Both have pros and cons. Uh, but I do have another tip, another tip cat. Um, writing stories is definitely a scenario where like too many cooks in the kitchen applies. Um, there's nothing worse than like having seven people telling me what to type, right? Uh, that, my God, that is so awful. So um, I recommend having the tech lead there for continuity and then like cycling through another engineer or two, depending on whether like they're working on that particular epic and they're already very familiar with the topic. Sometimes they're in it because they want to learn more about it um or sometimes they're in there because like you know they are the ones that are free um and that work is going to be coming up um again you do you 
but um, try not to have 11 people in a user story writing session. You will thank me. All right, uh, estimation is deciding what the relative effort of each story is. Like, is this the same as this? Is this bigger than this? How much bigger is it, right? Like, what is the complexity around this and how long do we think it's gonna take us to deliver it? It is not easy. It's not even pleasant, let me tell you. Like, this is hard stuff to do. By its very nature, it is not going to be accurate. Um, I've only worked with one engineer ever that did accurate estimates, and it was a project with one engineer in it. So <laughs> that ought to tell you something. Also, like, it's so much harder when the project starts because, like, nobody knows anything when they start, right? Like, I mean, you all know your respective jobs, but as far as, like, the project is concerned, there are so many complexities initially, but it does get easier. Um, you know more about the project. You know more about the stories. You know, it's not your first time doing X, Y, Z. Uh, part of the feature. So it does get easier. Um, I do give you some tips for estimation that you can um, look at, but I'm not going to say that it's easy. Uh, I will say make, one tip is to like include uh, or like be specific about what the story includes and what it excludes. Because even just talking about the things that it doesn't include is sometimes helpful. Again, validating assumptions, right? And, and getting that out there. And also making sure that um, like, if you want to have technical considerations in those stories, like that's great. Um, make the notes that are helpful for engineers. I try not to even look at those most of the time, um, but this is your section, right? Like this is the engineering section. Um, also make sure as you're estimating the work that you actually read the acceptance criteria. Uh, you will be amazed possibly at how many people uh, don't read the acceptance criteria and they end up delivering something slightly different uh, and that gets rejected. So. Uh, it's a particularly helpful piece of information to have at your disposal when estimating. My goodness, and then we're still just at the planning meeting, right? Um, all right, so by this time, this should be a done deal. Like, this should not be difficult because how many, talk, how many times have you already talked about priority, right? I think three slides um, already. So some people like to have a theme for each iteration or a goal or whatever. You do you. Um, but don't forget to carry over any unfinished work. Um, if there's something you didn't finish last iteration, you need to finish it this iteration. And some teams do commit to what they think they can deliver, and some don't, some just keep going. Um, there's no right or wrong way, just make sure that you understand what the norms are for your team. Um, we usually do that based on guessing at our velocity. And our velocity is basically like a rolling average of your past three iterations, meaning the first two weeks you're on a project, you have no idea what it's gonna be. The next two weeks, you kinda have no idea what it's gonna be. Um, but after you've gone through three iterations and more, you then start to become more predictable and more consistent. And that's the thing that you're after, just as a guideline, right? Like you're not gonna go from developing, from like delivering 10 points to delivering 50 points to delivering 200 points. Like that's not realistic. Uh, so keep an eye on what that looks like so that you have a really good sense of what the team can actually accomplish and it's reasonable. Also a well-planned IPM surprises no one. Uh, I feel like I should make a t-shirt of that. Uh, I've had IPMs that last 15 minutes. Uh, not just because I'm awesome, but because of all of the project work that's come before this, where people have signed up on all these things and have had an opportunity to view the stories, view the designs, talk with the product owner. So if you can get this to 15 minutes, that's awesome. If you can't, that's fine. Just, you know, get it to where the team needs it to be. And then uh, development and QA, this is probably what you think it is. Uh, you're working on your own code, the way that you agreed to work on your own code, things like PR requests, who's gonna review those, who's gonna merge the, the pull requests, etc. cetera. Um, again, you are writing tasks and passing them locally, please. And you are uh, hopefully then releasing to some sort of UAT or staging environment, whatever your team has agreed to do. Um, and you're doing some like happy path testing of your story, just so that you have a good peace of mind that the thing that you have um, delivered is actually working. Um, in the on a you know on a server, not just locally, and then you're passing that to QA, but you don't just drop it at that point. You pay attention to what the QA person or people are 
addressing, uh, you know, questions, issues, rejections, like your work will get rejected sometimes. I'm like, you know, that's okay. Uh, it's a, it's a learning moment as they say. So make sure you're paying attention to that and mm, try not to have too many stories in flight. When I see engineers that have like seven things happening at the same time, I know there's, there's a problem there. Um, either something is stuck, um, or like something is too complicated or is too many dependencies. So be mindful of having too many things in flight. Uh, also like, don't wait to the last minute to deliver things. Another pet peeve and a great cat picture, by the way, um, because then it rushes everyone else. I've worked on plenty of teams for like the last two days of a sprint. It's like, here you go, here's 20 new features. And you're like, go. Um, try not to do that, please, because realistically, you're not spending 20, you know, you're not spending two weeks developing um, every feature. All right, so the daily, um, it is just a progress update. Usually it's like, hey, what did you work on yesterday? What are you going to work on today? Are you blocked on anything? I am a stickler about having this only be 15 minutes tops because uh, I like to make good use of time. And sometimes those can be asynchronous, but I will warn you about all of them being asynchronous because at least in my experience, you start to just like see a wall of text in channels and you start to pay less attention and you're not talking about details. So I think there's a happy balance uh, between synchronous and asynchronous uh, updates. What I'd like to do is put cats on slides and save maybe like another 15 minutes after the daily so that the people who do need that extra time to go to talk about something in more detail can stay after. And like, if you don't need to be there, go on about your day and do what you gotta do. If you need to talk about a thing, then let's stay afterwards and talk about that thing. Let's make good use of people's time. Uh, and then you're gonna demo the work that you finished and is working. If it's not done, don't show it. Uh, like that doesn't count. It's gonna be called hangover. Not a hangover, it's hangover work. And that's what you're going to start uh, or keep going on the next sprint. And ideally, during the demo, you're getting feedback, like not just from your product owner, because they probably are pretty familiar with the features by this point, ideally from users um, or a larger group of stakeholders. Um, I work with a, like a department of medicine uh, that had like one product owner, and we talked to him, you know, uh, Every day, like you know exactly what was going on, but every two weeks, like 20 other people from other parts of the university would show up and see how we were doing against our, um, how, how we were progressing against our goals, which are part of the larger organization goals. So always expect to have different types of people show up at your demos. Um, I like to have engineers uh, and designers like present at the demos. I think this is up to you, uh, your level of comfort, but it does build uh, trust with the client over the internal stakeholders. Cause like, I will never do as good of a job explaining your work as you will, right? Um, and so like making sure that, um, that you can do that if you feel comfortable and if it makes sense is definitely something that I recommend. Uh, then you do a release. In reality, um, I have not seen every of one of my projects release every two weeks. It is not that, common um, is ideal, but not necessarily common, especially if you work in like highly regulated environments. Um, I worked for a customer that included like pharmaceutical companies and like the number of things that have to be audited and checked and triple checked for that is pretty significant. So like you can't just be like, all right, we're going to release tomorrow. Um, also things like release notes, um, are those required? I don't know, uh, ask and find out before you do the release. And if you cannot release to production, make sure at least you have a couple of environments that are up to date. Uh, some people have a training environment that's separate from like a staging or a UAT environment. Um, whatever you use is fine, but that's where you at least want to try to release. And then you've got a retrospective to celebrate the things that went well, the things that did not, and what we wanna change for the next couple of weeks. Um, you can have some fun with this. You can change up the format. I give you some links here or some resources here in this link to have some different retro formats. Um, I also like to do that because not everyone likes to like fill up a board with sticky notes and talk about them in round robin fashion. If that's what you do, um, people have different learning styles. And so, you know, you know, change things up, but make sure that things are like are actually actionably 
actually actionable, goodness, uh, get recorded and that you're working on those. Like if you're not doing that, then you're just in a complaining session. You're just complaining. That might be okay every now and then. Uh, I certainly need to be able to vent every now and then to my teammates. But long term, that's not particularly helpful because it doesn't help you change anything, right? Um, so in terms of like things that might come up at a retro, and I'm done after this, um, there could be small changes uh, to designs or like things that we didn't think about till we till we thought about it when we were doing the demo, for example. Or maybe we want to change the priorities for the next iteration. Maybe there's some things that we've learned we don't know enough of so we want to do some spikes um, to discover some unknowns i give you the definition of that here but it's basically discovery technical discovery um this comes up a lot too like we're not pairing enough and i don't mean just engineer to engineer but engineers and designers or engineers and uh, product owners etc pairing is awesome it saves you so much uh rework uh, a lot of people always want to tweak some components of the rituals or times or whatever. Uh, and then I'm pretty sure this is my committing to having fewer stories in flight at once. Uh, that seems like a thing that I would have on there. Um, or maybe like we know that the next iteration, we need to change our velocity because people are going to be off or because we underestimated the complexity of something. Uh, those are all different things that have come up in retrospectives. So this is just my little recap slide to refresh your memory of the things that we covered. Uh, I'm going to get to questions, um, but I also will have these resources for you that I hope are useful to you. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, give you yet another cat on a roller coaster, and my contact information as well. So with that, Adrian, you have been waiting for so long. What was your question, sir? There you go. So yeah, uh, thank, thanks, first of all, for, for your presentation. It's uh, really resourceful and really right. clear. So thank you. Um, for this, my question is two questions regarding balance. Um, how do you balance uh, managing uh, the team uh, when it comes to micro and, or, or micro managing? How does that work for you as a project manager, knowing that there's so many things you have to uh, look over? It's a really good question. I used to be a micromanager and then I went the complete opposite and that was also bad. Uh, it's been hard for me, but I've had to learn to trust the people that I work with. Uh, it's like trust, but verify, right? So initially you trust that they're gonna do their best, but you keep an eye on things. Um, and when you start to see things that maybe you don't understand or that you would do differently, Maybe then you question that. You talk to the person one on one and try and figure out if like you just work differently or like if there's some misunderstanding. But overall, like I prefer to uh, I prefer to trust that the people I'm working with are absolutely doing the best that they can. We just may have different understandings of like what their roles or responsibilities are or what they're working on. There's so many assumptions that we make on a daily basis. Um, that basically like i try to avoid those and be explicit um i also recognize that like there's people that i'm never going to work well with uh together right like we're just we're so different i may love them as humans but like as co-workers they're very difficult for our uh working styles to mesh and so i may have for example more one-on-ones with them or i may uh, request more feedback from them one thing i always do no matter what is i have a one-on-one -on -one with every single person on the team um, just to check in sometimes it's social sometimes you know it's whatever they bring to the table but it's an exchange like i give them feedback i ask for their feedback um, and honestly like that's the time to tell me the things that they're not going to bring up in a retro or in a meeting with the client uh, sometimes people are going through like divorces you know god forbid and like their performance is impacted but they don't want the rest of the team to know like those are real things that happen um, because we're people right uh and like things happen to us so being able to give everyone the benefit of the doubt but still keep an eye on stuff right like you're right it is a it is a balance and so um you still have to like run your reports you still have to look at some metrics like the um like your burn down charts and those kinds of things are important um but things like your cycle time are also important if someone is taking um, 
I don't know, like six days from the start of a story to the delivery. Like that feels like a long time for what they think is a small story, right? So like find out what's happening with that. And not from a punitive way, but like, hey, maybe we wrote a really crappy story. I've done it. Um, maybe something about it was confusing or maybe somebody's stuck and like they just forgot to bring it up at the at the daily. It could be so many things. So like the data is your tool to help you have better working relationships with your colleagues and with your clients, if, if that's who you have, um, and help you manage the project so that you're not micromanaging every single thing. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and that definitely did. Uh, I appreciate it. And my second, second part to that question is, uh, how still works the life balance for a Scrum Master, a project manager? That's very different. Um, so the reason I'm answering that is because when, well, let's see. So you want to know about the work-life balance between a project manager and a scrum master? I, I thought they were the same thing. Sorry. So project managers is different. Ah, right. That, that's my follow-up question. Okay. So again, it depends on the organization, organization where you work. Uh, where I worked, I did it all. So I did product, project, and I was a scrum master. Uh, in some larger companies, uh, they have the luxury of having just Scrum Masters, which must be so nice, <laughs> right? Um, but project managers usually deal with, like, budgets and forecasts and, like, staffing things that, like, product owners don't necessarily or Scrum Masters don't. Um, from my experience, I'll tell you that it's less the role that's about work-life balance um, it's more about the type of business that you're in. Uh, so like I worked for a consultancy for years. First of all, I worked for a nonprofit for 15 years. Like they're, the work-life balance, they're just awful. <laughs> Cause like you're trying to do so much with so little, um, in a consultancy, you're always trying, trying to do more. You're always trying to, uh, please the client as much as possible and deliver as much. I mean, I was working 50 hour weeks, right? Like, and, and I burnt out and like, I was on a watch list. Like I was warned not to work more than 45 hours a week, uh, but like, if it had to be done, it had to be done. And I did it. Um, I will tell you though, that like now I work part-time. Um, so my work-life balance is awesome. I get to swim in the mornings, um, but that also required me moving to, you know, near Barcelona where like things are just different. Um, and it's also a lot harder to find, uh, the kind of work that I do. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, and that's, that's my experience. I can't speak to work-life balance for everyone who does this. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Other questions, comments? I am going to move to my contact information again so that you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to add, ask any follow-up things or whatnot. Uh, I'll be happy to do that because I know they took a, a bunch of time today and I appreciate being here probably during your lunch times and in between other things. Um, yeah, anything else on your mind? Is there anything I didn't cover that you would like to know more about because i'm always thinking about doing new things in the future as well so think about that uh luis what do you have to say <clears throat> hello um sorry for my english it's not that fluent but um Puedes preguntarme how... en español, si prefieres. Ah, <laughs> okay <laughs> gotcha <laughs> hey. well i would prefer to do it in english so i can practice but um okay uh, how would you describe uh, the relationship with, relationship with uh, between the project manager and a junior developer? Oh, that's a really good one. So here's what's hard, right? Um, as a as a seasoned project manager, I don't always know what junior engineers know. Um, because I'm not like, I don't know what their, I know their skill set. Like I know what they've learned, but I don't yet have a sense of how they work in a project. Um, likewise, 
junior engineers may never have worked on a project or may not have the breadth of project experience that I have. So they tend to um, worry a little bit more about what happens in a project. They tend to be more stressed about things. My approach is like, well, I've seen it all, uh, right? Like I've seen a little bit of everything and it's fine. We're going to get through this. But that's not always the, the case of someone who is, uh, who's a new engineer. So I think what's really great, first of all, those one-on-ones um, are great to get to know people like as humans um, and to voice some of the concerns. Because I also, like, I might have expectations of someone who is more junior that I shouldn't have. I've certainly made that mistake before. Um, the other thing that is particularly helpful, I think, is to have the technical lead um, be part of those conversations sometimes or, um, you know, like create opportunities for that exchange. Lead, like technical leads are like magical creatures. Um, they are fabulous. They are so good at what they do and they can teach a junior engineer things about working in a project that I can't. Uh, and I'm done talking about code. I'm talking about how to approach a project technically. And those are some of the things that I'm limited in doing, but I certainly can explain, um, like I can explain concepts and practices and I can help ease anxiety um, around maybe like talking to a client um, or like what to, what to say or not say in a retro or how to approach a specific thing. Uh, those are the kinds of like, I don't want to call them tensions, but like, I don't know, topics that tend to come up um, between me as a project manager and someone who is pretty new to the industry. Totally the same thing goes for junior designers, by the way. I don't know if that helped answer your question, Luis. Yes, it really helped. Thank you. You're welcome. Alyssa, do we have a hard stop or I'm happy to keep taking questions? I don't have a hard stop. That's up to you and, and everybody else. Okay. Um, so did anything not get covered that you would have liked to learn about? I did not cover everything. Come on. <laughs> All right. Y'all are tired and hungry and ready to go back to work. Excellent. Um, if you do think of something else, uh, please feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, ask away, and yeah, definitely leverage my network as well. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye bye. Adios. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Ciao, ciao. De nada. <laughs> ciao.